Alright everyone, hello, you're listening to Lipstick and Leather, I'm your host Ryan Trush, and on the phone with me right now is Sean Mars. How's your day going today, Sean? Doing great, doing great, everything's great here. Now with Blood, Sweat and Beers being recorded in three days, did you play all the instruments on the album? Actually, yeah, there's a funny story behind that. <clears throat> I had my drummer, um, you know, because it was during the, uh, the whole lockdown thing and stuff, so mm-hmm. I was talking to different guys about doing different projects and different things. So I said to my drummer, I said, can you go and just record some drums on your iPhone in the garage? He had his drum set up in the garage. So he sent me like five drum tracks. And I, with those five drum tracks, I created ten songs out of five drum tracks. So there's duplicate drum tracks. I mean, I, I you know, I, some I sped up and some I, you know, I chopped up and did different things. But yeah, so it was the whole thing. And then I essentially took those five drum tracks plugged my guitar into my laptop and um, just uh, just banged out 10 ideas and then came back to it like maybe a week later and then finished it up, you know, um, just, you know, through it. So it was just done really fast. It was just, I, I you know, it, it was like, you know, tongue in cheek, half serious, but, you know, when you're, you know, when you're locked down and you just, you know, I like putting a little pressure on them, you know, a little fire under myself and it's i'm actually the funny thing is i'm working on another one too i'm working on a follow-up uh thing just like that right now actually i just was playing guitar a couple minutes ago and um finishing up some ideas so you know until i get you know everything back together and you know get everybody into a real studio and stuff it's just something fun to do it just i like being creative and i i pretty much write a song every day i mean anytime i pick up a guitar I don't sit and just try to figure out, you know, how to play some Zeppelin song or something. I just goof around with riffs and things and just, I end up writing, almost accidentally just writing songs almost every day. And it's just, and then I just go back and there's hundreds and hundreds of ideas that I just go back and just check out little things and, you know, try to finish them up. But yeah, the whole thing was done in a very short period of time, like three, maybe four days, something like that. Um, and then I just maybe went back and tweaked it, you know what I mean, a little bit, um, with editing and stuff, but, um, yeah, and then I just threw it up on, um, up on iTunes and Amazon and whatever, it's, you know, people seem to like it, there's, you know, a couple songs, we played the other day, um, down here, a place called The Headliner in Neptune, we, uh, we played a show with six bands, and we did two of the songs, um, Wild Kingdom and Meat Town off that, so we did it, it's funny, because, the other premise, too, of doing the Blood, Sweat, and Beers was I wanted it to be just short, dumb, like, rock, guitar rock songs. Just like, you know, like, not. I didn't want it to be, you know, I didn't want it to sound, you know, well, it's obviously not going to sound like anything major being done on a, you know, on an iPhone that, <laughs> in a garage and whatever. But I just wanted it to be, like, punk rock, you know, the first Ramones album or something, you know, just just real simple and just, you know, not, not put a lot of, a lot of crazy bells and whistles on it. A couple, two guitars, bass and drums. And yes, I did play on Blood, Sweat, and Beers. I played everything and sang everything except for the drums. So to answer that question. Very cool. Rumor and reel to reel would sound awesome live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny, like the, the two songs that I thought that did sound a little bit, well, actually that, that reel to reel, um, has a kind of a Joe Jackson kind of thing going on. Like mm-hmm. the first Joe Jackson look sharp album. I forget what song, but um, when I started doing that with the minor chords and stuff, I was like, oh, this kind of sounds a little Joe Jackson-y. I was like, I kind of, I like this. Because I have, I, my influences are all over the place. You know what I mean? And so, you know, if I, could, if I, I end up sounding like Joe Jackson or Elvis Costello or something like that, I'm thrilled. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, oh, cool. Because, you know, I just, it's different. I'm, I, you know, the more interesting something is to me, the more I'm inspired. Like, I just, you know, I don't want it to, I, I, I hate sounding like other things that, you know, even though I know I do, and I always go, oh my God, that sounds exactly like Two Ticks to the Paradise, or, right. oh my God, that, you know what I mean? I just ripped off the Red Hot Chili Peppers, or, oh my, and you don't think, you don't know you're doing it, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes someone will point it out to you later or something, you're like, oh, well, what are you going to do? Of course. 
Now, being a fan of owning hard copies, will there ever be a hard copy on vinyl, CD, etc., of Blood, Sweat, and Beers, or a cash grab? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> there, there never will be because, and and for the, you know, the, 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 I would love everything to come out on vinyl because I love vinyl and I've always had, you know, I've always had a vinyl fetish and I've always been a vinyl collector. But it's just, it's just too friggin' expensive. I mean, you know, as a business person. You know, why would you manufacture, you know, a thousand pairs of shoes that, you know, you're only going to sell a hundred pairs of shoes. So, you know what I mean? And you're never going to make your money back. And it's like, you know, I don't, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather eat, you know? So I, it's just simple hard facts. If I could find somebody that wants to invest and distribute, then, oh, for, you know, I'll go into a real studio right now and redo everything and do, you know, whatever, but it's just those days are seem to be in the past, at least for me at this point, which is fine. You know, I like, I like very DIY and it's just easier to just, I can record and have, you know, at the end of the week, I can have it up on iTunes or whatever, you know, brand new stuff. So, um, and I know you're a big fan of the hard copy stuff, and, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so am I, I mean, you know, there's nothing quite like reading all the minor notes and seeing pictures and whatever, but, you know, it, it's really just not cost-effective for me at this point. Mm -hmm. Does yourself and the Betty Ford Falcons plan to record any originals? Um, yes, actually. Um, right now, well, that project started out as just like a local, um, like a, a cover thing just for down the shore here. I live down in the, down the Jersey shore and there's a lot of places to play. And we do, a, um, we do all like mostly seventies rock. Like it's a lot of seventies stuff, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, a little bit of eighties. We do a little priest and stuff. Um, we do, but it's mostly just like, you, you know, uh, Zeppelin, Kiss, Aerosmith, Cheap Trick. We do some beat, we do Beatles and Stones, which, you know, We'll do, like, Miss You by the Stones and stuff. Um, so we have a lot of fun with that. But, yeah, you know, I can only do that for so long, and then I want to start creating stuff. So I actually uh, i am going to get together with those guys in the next couple of weeks and start working on some stuff in a different, kind of a different vein, more of that 70s rock feel, you know what I mean? So I want to kind of keep it within that <clears throat> type of sound, if you will. Definitely. Now, how, how did you hook up with the awesome Vic Pepe, who, of course, has had lots of Alice Cooper connections, co-rates and whatnot, to record Meet and Monster Beach Party? We, um, I, I was working with um, Keith Roth had come to me, who is a, he's a DJ on uh, Sirius XM. Uh, Hair Nation he does, and I, I think Ozzy's Boneyard, and yeah. I think one other. But he, um, we were in different bands at the time, but we became really good friends. And we said, um, let's do something together. Let's record something together. So he had an investor um, give us money to go into the studio and record a bunch of cover songs to put it out. And we ended up putting it out on our own label, Main Man. Um, but Vic Pepe, he, his, it was his studio that we used. So we, we recorded it at his studio. He had a small studio. Um, I forget what town it was in. It was up in North Jersey. But he had a small studio. I think it was a 16-track or something. And we went in and recorded, um, you know, all those songs on that Mutant Monster Beach Party. It's all, it's all like covers, you know, mainly, mainly from the 70s. And then we also went in and did what was the Chrome Daddy stuff at Vic Pepe's studio, which is me, Keith... And Scotty Hill from Skid Row, um, we did. Uh, we were starting a, like a little side project called Chrome Daddy, and we also <clears throat> worked with Vic on that. So he was kind of like the engineer, producer, you know. Now Tony Bongiovi is thanking the sp spanking Ray Gun liner notes. Did Mars Need Women ever consider getting Tony to produce the CD? No, uh, he is. I believe that he was working with our manager at the time. He was helping him out. So it really wasn't directly related to us personally at all, and he didn't have anything to do with the music or the production or anything. I, I, 
I'm not even sure if I might have met him once or twice in my lifetime. But he uh, he was managing, I think he might have been managing Keith Roth's band at the time. They were called Bad Biscuit. And I think that's where, I think our manager at the time, Brian Nelson, was friends with him. And they somehow connected with different, you know, I, I don't know, the they commiserated or whatever they did. They commingled their, pulled their resources together, I guess. Mm. I don't know at that time, but I don't, yeah. Very cool. Now, knowing Robin Zander, of course, um, you opened for him in 1997 with Mars Needs Women. Did he ever hear the track No Show from 1995's Sparking Regan, which is, of course, a nod to Cheap Trick? Um, I'm sure they have, and I think, because we used to play that song live when we would open up to them sometimes and so you know we would do the whole he's a whore ending you know towards the end of it whatever you know have you seen her face and um yeah it, it, i actually have a, some cool robin sanders stories but um i'm not sure i can't i can't guarantee that he heard the song but um i'm pretty sure because they, you know, were in close proximity of the song being played, and I know that sometimes he would stand side stage and watch us and stuff, so, yeah. Nice. Now, what are your, some of your other cool Robin Zander stories? All right, well, I have two. We were playing um, a theater in Miami. We are opening up for Robin, and we had just got on playing, and we are walking off stage, and he kind of, like, tapped me on his shoulder and said, you know, hey, that was a great set. But he was wearing, like, the white suit, so it was almost like the Budokan, it was like Budokan Robin Zander, like, telling me that. And I was like, yeah, I was like floored. I was like, whoa. Because like, I, I was huge, I still am, but huge Cheap Trick fan, you know, back in the you know late 70s like everyone else was. But I was, even before the Budokan record came out, I was a fan. Like, I, I was just, in fact, I think their first album is, that's my favorite album. But they, uh, you know, getting open up for them, that was, that was crazy because we did so many shows with them too and um mm -hmm. so one of the coolest stories for robin zander was we were at um i forget where we were playing what was it um i don't know it was somewhere way out west um it wasn't california but we were playing and it was like kind of like a the, the place we we're playing was all done up very texas style and it was big long horns over the thing and over the stage it was like really crazy but after we got done it was me robin and randy castillo oh, wow who was there at the show he was backstage and robin was like dude you want to go next door there was like a like a go-go bar or something next door you want to go next door and you know get a beer so me robin and we just walked so it was like me robin zander and randy castillo walked out the front door and walk next door to the to the other bar, and we're sitting at like a little little table. And uh, you know, Robin bought me a beer and stuff. I, I was just I, I don't even remember the conversation because I think I was just too too floored that I was even like there at the time. I was like amazed. But so uh, yeah, I'm trying to think where that was. Uh, I'm getting old. I'm losing my I'm losing my memory. But yeah, so that was very cool just to have them. And uh, another <clears throat> part of that story is that. Years later, when not very like two years later, when I played with I opened up the Motley Crue mm -hmm. with uh, with those on Monday, the Skid Row guys, Randy Castillo. That was during when he was playing drums for them. Right before, like, I think they were touring the new Tattoo album, or maybe it didn't have, it hadn't come out yet. But he actually remembered me. He was like, "Hey, I remember you." I was like, "Oh my God, that's crazy!" So he remembered me from that one night. <laughs> Very cool. Now, how did you get Butch Walker to produce Jenny Lies and then some off Red Means Go? Um, I was doing the, the Ozo Monday thing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really good. I mean, it was going as you would expect. I mean, it was, they're, they're skid row. You know what I mean? And they wanted to do, you know, I think they just wanted to take a breather and do something different. You know what I mean? And Scotty had been like a drinking buddy of mine, and he produced, Scotty produced uh, some Mars Needs Women demos prior to us getting signed. Mm -hmm. And so I was friends with Scotty, and then we were doing that 
Chrome Daddy thing with Keith Roth. And when that didn't go, you know, we did, you know, the Oza Monday stuff, I, you know, I, well, I guess we'll talk about that later. But so towards the end of that, we had just done all the, the Kiss shows and the Motley show. And, uh, like nothing was really panning out. Like I can hear the whispers in the background that they kind of just were kind of over it and wanted to get, you know, put Skid Row back together. And I was, I was right there telling them they should. I was like, you guys just get Sebastian back. I think you guys would do great. You know, I mean, just, you know. And so I got a phone call from my old guitar player from Mars Eats Women who had just spoken to the manager of Marvelous 3, which was Butch Walker's band at the time. Mm-hmm. Her name was Nancy Camp. And she had seen Mars Eats Women when we were on tour with Cheap Trick, and she loved the band, and she wanted to work with us, but we had a manager at the time. So here it was, you know, fast forward two years or whatever, and she said, look, I can get you in the studio with Butch Walker probably get you a new deal with Electra and get you on some, you know, cool shows and stuff. So she she kind of was like, she didn't force my hand, but she was like, look, the Skid Row thing is, isn't going to go anywhere for you, so I'm giving you an opportunity to do some really cool stuff here. I really like these new songs that I heard, Jenny Lies and a bunch of songs <clears throat> that I had, you know, I was just writing up a storm. And so she said, I'll put you in the studio with Butch Walker, blah, blah, blah. So it was Nancy Camp then that who, you know, uh, hooked us up. We went to um, we went to um, Atlanta for like a week, or not even a week, maybe three, four days, and, uh, you know, worked with Butch at uh, Tree Studios, I believe, and Matchbox 20, I think, was working in like the bigger room at Tree Studios, and we were in the other room. I remember that the guitar player, Kyle, had walked in, was checking out. I was like, oh, dude, I know you. <laughs> it was pretty funny. So, yeah, in those, like, two years, two, three years, I was with a lot of elbows with a lot of famous people. But it was, it was kind of, it was fun. It was a good time. So it was Nancy Camp to answer your question. Okay, sounds good. Now on the I'm, pro- I'm long-winded, right? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I'm enjoying it. Oh. <laughs> Now, on the Chrome Daddy topic, why the name changed from Big Top to Chrome Daddy? Oh, how do you know about that? <laughs> I, um, because Scotty didn't like the name Big Top. That's <laughs> why. Flat out. It was just flat out. He didn't like the name Big Top. You, I, I actually had a cassette tape, and I had the cover all made up on my printer, and it said Big Top on it, and it had all my demos of, like, all those songs, and I said... And then Keith was like, oh, dude, we should get Scotty in the band. I'm like, Scotty's not going to do it. Blah, blah, blah. So he asked him, and Scotty goes, yeah, I'll do it. But but I, I I had a song called Chrome Daddy. He goes, yeah, I'll do it, but let's call it Chrome Daddy. I was like, oh, whatever, whatever it takes to get you in the band. Gotcha. Now, I love the Chrome Daddy CD. It's the last CD I own personally with a hidden track. How did the band decide to cover Isaac Haynes' Do You Do Your Own Thing? Cover what? Isaac Haynes' Do Your Own Thing? It's the bonus track on the Chrome Daddy, the hidden track, I should say, not bonus track, the hidden track. Oh, is it? Yep. <laughs> I, I'll be honest with you, I don't even remember. I don't remember. I think we might have did that at our own studio. We had a, at Main Man, we had a, in Asbury Park, we had a, um, we had a rehearsal facility. It was like four rooms, and then we had like a recording. And we did that for a couple of years. So that was all taking place also during that whole 97 through 2000 period whatever and um i know we were recording a lot of stuff like we would just goof around and record so it was probably just i i don't remember exactly why we did that i think we submitted it i think around that time didn't they didn't they redo shaft i think i think we submitted it to the shaft soundtrack that makes sense (laughs) yeah i think that's what it was about that out yeah that's funny. All right. Now, on to Ozone Monday. Now, we were talking about Scotty, of course. Scotty wasn't Chrome Daddy with you. Was the was that the connection that helped to form Ozone Monday and meet the Skid Row guys? Yes. I think Scotty went to the Skid Row guys because everyone was kind of doing side stuff. Like, everybody from Skid Row, I think they just needed a break. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, you know, around 96, 7, 6, and around 96, 97 or whatever, it really wasn't a great time to be in one of those 80s bands. You know what I mean? It was kind of like yeah. passe, and it was, you know, and a lot of bands, a lot of bands like Bon Jovi, like a lot of bands just plowed through it and no problem, you know. But um, 
they were having, you know, they were having, you know, and it's well publicized. They were always knocking heads with Sebastian. Sebastian's, a, you know, he's he's a funny guy, and I've met him a bunch of times, and you know, we he, we have no bad blood, there's nothing. But you know, he uh, he's a handful, and I guess it's you know, it, after a while, it gets to be it gets to be a little bit much. I don't know. I, I never had to deal with him in that in that way, so I don't know. But um, so Scotty had. He was working with me. Rachel was doing something. Uh, Prenella scales, maybe. He was doing Prenella scales. Yeah, right. So he was doing the Prenella scales thing with Elwood, who's now the bass player of ZZ Top, which is which is great for him. But um, so Rachel was doing that, and I forget what Snake was doing, and the, uh, Robert Fuso was like doing like a funk cover band or something. Mm-hmm. So everyone was kind of still doing musical things just apart from each other. And then what happened was Scotty had brought, the, I think, the Chrome Daddy stuff over to Snake's house. Snake had a studio in his basement. Real nice setup. In fact, we did a lot of the Ozone stuff there. But he uh, he brought it there, and, the, and those guys listened to it. And then I remember I was home one afternoon, and I had just gotten back from doing some shows, I think, with Cheap Trick. And um, so I was home for, like, a couple weeks. And I got a call from Scotty, and he said, look, the guys, you know, Snake and those guys, they want they want to know if you want to come down and sing. We have a couple of new songs that we want to send over to the label, but, you know, we just, we'll just see if you maybe want to come down and just sing on them just to demo them up so we could have something to send over you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and i was like dude i can't sing like that i don't do they were like no it's not like that it's it's more like middle of the road stuff it's you know whatever which shows on monday pretty much was so i said sure yeah i'll come back you know yeah because i never met rachel at that point or rob i I think i had met snake so i went down and um you know we were just Snake had a kegerator and his, you know, down there we were just drinking beers and having a good time and, you know, hanging out with the guys. It was a lot of fun, you know. Here I am rubbing elbows again. And I think I sang on one song or two songs. Uh, I think it was a few days later. He called me back. He says, you got, you want to come down and do some more? I was like, yeah, sure. So I went back. And after we got done, they kind of sat me down and they said, look, we we were thinking about doing like a side thing. Would you be interested in, and I said, well, only if I could write with you guys. I said, I can't just, I'm just, they were like, oh, no, 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 sure, sure, no, we like the stuff that you do and our stuff's going to, you know, we're going to try to do, it's going to be more like that. It's going to be more in that that vein, you know. They they, they wanted to be more like their first album, I think that was, but a little bit more, you know, because nobody writes one style of music and nobody listens to one style of music mm-hmm. everybody likes the beatles even though you're in a death metal band you know what i'm saying like right. you could like all kinds of stuff and i think they just wanted to spread their rings, wings out a little bit more and do you know some other stuff you know everybody was like into um, radiohead at the time and you know whatever you know so i said yeah sure so we uh started writing and became like you know i would go to like Snake's house maybe <clears throat> a few times a week, and we would just write, and we just write, 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 and, and you know, that's pretty much <clears throat> what happened with that. Um, but, yeah, so to answer your question, long story short, Scotty had brought the uh, Chrome Daddy demos over, and those guys heard it, and uh, that's pretty much what led me to get getting involved with those guys with the uh, Ozone on Monday. <clears throat> Awesome. Now, supposedly Ozone Monday were close to be signed to Columbia. Um, how come this didn't happen? Um, really good question. I don't know how the answer to that. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard that. I heard the same thing. And then at one point, I know we were getting offers from smaller, like smaller labels mm-hmm. that were, you know, you know, there's a lot of those those bands from the '80s that are, you know, they were signing up with like some of those smaller labels or whatever and i said dude what, what, i was you know i said let's just do that let's you know just grab that we get some tour support and we go out on the road you know i i wanted to, you know i was in the middle of it you know i wanted to i wanted to work i wanted to do it you know i wanted to I was really into the you know being in that band and stuff so 
but they would pass on anything, you know, small because they were used to, you know, when you're going out for steak dinner every Friday, you don't want to just all of a sudden go to the McDonald's drive through I guess. I don't know. So, <laughs> But I was used to McDonald's drive through I was fine with it. You know what I mean? I just wanted to get out there and play. So, I don't know. I guess they were holding out for something bigger and better, and it just wasn't really coming, which, you know, is partly my fault, I guess. You know, it's like, you know, people want to see Skid Row. You know, and it started to get, too, also, when we were playing out, some of the promoters would say, can you throw maybe some Skid Row songs in there? And when that started happening, I was like, mm, yeah, no, I can't. Like, it's not that I, I, I protested it. I just, I physically don't have the pipes. I can't, you know, I can't sing that high. You know, I don't have that kind of voice. So, you know. So live shows, uh, Ozone Monday never did any Skid Row tracks. No, not one. No. Interesting. Now, did Michael Wagner produce the Ozone Monday 10-track CD? Michael Wagner produced um, a large batch of demos. Mm. Yes, he, he produced a lot of demos, but um, I, I, I recall going to Nashville to his studio. Actually, it's, his studio was located in on like a small, almost like a farm, where Wolf from Accept lived with his wife, and there was like a building in the back. And that's where the studio was. And we used to go, we went there, I think it was twice, Nashville, and we went and recorded, you know, a bunch of songs. We, you know, we'd record like a huge batch of songs, and then we'd go back and record another batch of songs. And But then we would always be recording also just at Snake's house. And ultimately what was going to be like our, it was sort of like our, our mega demo was like, 10 songs that we had recorded both at Snake's house and recorded with Nick Dadia, who had worked with um, Stone Temple Pilots and stuff in Philly. We went over, the, went to Philly and uh, touched up a bunch of stuff and then mixed it and mastered it over there. So, um, I mean, there, it's been making the rounds. There's people out there that have copies of that. I'm not sure how it got leaked out, but... Um, just, you know, some good stuff. I've, I've played some songs off at, at, at live shows from time to time, especially uh, Born a Beggar, which I wrote with Scotty. Um, and uh, I know that actually made it onto their Thick Skin record because from time to time I'll get a $3 check from Japan <laughs> <laughs> from that because of that song. So, you know, the, I, know that, I know that they're doing well in Japan. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Now, on the Skid Row topic, were you asked to audition or join Skid Row after Ozone Monday? No, no. I think they were mad at me because I kind of I kind of just quit the Ozone Monday thing. It wasn't like, it was kind of one of those things where I saw the writing on the wall, and I, I guess I guess I was being a, a dick, if I'm allowed to say the word dick, but I just said it twice now. But I... Uh, I kind of just like blew them. I kind of quit. You know, like when you, you know, you, like you, you think your chick's gonna break up with you, and you just break up with her first. Like, so you, you know what I mean? I kind of <laughs> yes. I wanted to get, I wanted to beat them to the pass. You know what I mean? Because I, I wouldn't. They wouldn't never even have thought to have me audition for Skid Row because they just knew that I, I don't have the pipes. You know what I mean? It's not my thing. I don't have the voice. So it wouldn't even have been unless they wanted to do like what Kiss does now and tune down the eight steps, or whatever. You know, I'm not gonna be able to be busting out wasted time or. You know, uh, half of those songs. So, um, yeah, no, I I never saw that coming at all. I mean, I know they, Rachel specifically pulled me aside and wanted me to start possibly singing some Skid Row songs during those on Monday shows. Um, I think uh, I Remember You, he wanted me to do it at one point, and I was just like, dude, I my voice doesn't do that. <laughs> I, got a, I mean, I guess I could have figured out a way how to maybe get around it, like maybe tune down or maybe work on my singing a little bit. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, it never happened. I don't know. you got a pretty cool voice, and I could see uh, you pulling that off personally. But mm, uh, Yeah, it would probably hurt. It's if you want to or not, too, right? It's another issue. So. <laughs> yeah, I kind of didn't want it because I didn't see it as that. I saw it as like we were doing like a whole new band, but, I, you know, Everybody else just, you know, it's hard. Everybody's looking at them like, dude, you guys are Skid Row. Who are you kidding? Like, why are you doing this? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, they could have just went, 
you know, I always thought I was like, if you just get Sebastian back in the band, just you probably can just go out and tour with, you know, Guns N' Roses or something. I don't know, which I always wondered why they, to this day, haven't just done that. But, you know, I guess just there's bad blood there. Yep. Do you stay in touch with any of the Skid Row guys? 